Encryption is broken. The internet as we know it, your personal photos, passwords, banking information, state secrets, all vulnerable because of a 400 year old algorithm and some sloppy implementation. Welcome to today's Math Minute, only Math Minute guaranteed to be today, only Math Minute guaranteed to be about how encryption is broken. Modern encryption, you may be aware of, depends basically on the fact that multiplication is easy, but undoing multiplication is hard. In other words, if you gave any random third or fourth grader a problem like 113 times 79, it might take them a few minutes, and they would have to be careful not to make any mistakes, but for sure, if you check back in within, let's say, five minutes, they would be able to get this question right. That's because, of course, we teach third and fourth graders an algorithm for multiplication, and it's an algorithm that they can follow in order to to multiply any two numbers in a pretty straightforward manner. On the other hand, if we take the product of that algorithm, if we take the result, in this case, 8,927, and we said, hey, work your way backwards to the two factors that were multiplied together to make 8,927, that is a much more difficult and time-consuming process. Because even though we have a division algorithm, for example, we don't know what number to start dividing by. We might think, well, does three go into 8,927? But as we we divide it out, we find that 3 does not go into 8,927 evenly. There's a remainder at the end of the process. To get back to these factors, we want there not to be a remainder at the end of the process. So now we have to ask, okay, 3 doesn't go into 8,927. Will 5 go into 8,927? Will 7? Will 11? Will 13? And we end up having to check every single prime number to see whether or not it's a factor of 8,927. Every single prime number up to roughly the square root of 8,927. It is precisely this difference in difficulty that lets modern encryption work, because I can choose two prime numbers that are known only to me and multiply them together and make that result public, and even though that result is public, it's going to be very difficult for someone out there to try and take my public product and work backwards to the secret factors I use to make that public product. Unless, that is, I have chosen my prime numbers poorly and they apply a particular algorithm that Pierre de Fermat wrote about roughly 400 years ago. The algorithm works like this. Imagine you're looking at some odd number, and you don't know whether that odd number is prime or not. Of course, every number can be written as one times itself, so you could factor it that way, but you want to figure out, is there another way that you could factor it? Every single odd number is the difference between two squares, or in symbols, we can say that k, some large odd number we're going to select, must be equal to a squared minus b squared. Let's actually start with some smaller odd number first, just so you can get a sense of how this is working. Imagine that k is actually our odd number 11, and we're trying to figure out how can we factor 11. 11, being an odd number, can be written as the difference of two squares. In this particular case, we can write it as the difference between 6 squared and 5 squared. That is, 6 squared, of course, is 36, 5 squared is 25, and 11 is the same thing as 36 minus 25. But anything that can be written as the difference of two squares can also be written in the factored form of the difference between two squares. That is basically the square roots plus each other and the square roots minus each other. In this case, that is specifically 6 plus 5 times 6 minus 5. Now, because 6 plus 5 is 11 and 6 minus 5 is 1, this is what we would consider a trivial factorization. Of course, 11 can be written as 11 times 1. And in fact, because 11 happens to be prime, this is also the only factorization that's possible. But let's imagine a different odd number that's not prime, something like 15. On the one hand, yes, 15 can once again be written in a trivial way. It happens to be the difference between the two consecutive squares, 8 squared minus 7 squared. 8 squared is 64, 7 squared is 49, 64 minus 49 is 25. And so we can write 15 as the product of 8 plus 7 times 8 minus 7. 8 plus 7, of course, is 15. 8 minus 7 is 1. And once again, we have our trivial factorization. 15 is the same as 15 times 1. But 8 and 7 are not the only perfect squares that have a difference of 15. You could also choose, for example, 4 squared and 1 squared. 4 squared is 16. 1 squared is 1. 
1, 16 minus 1 is also 15. And this leads us to a different factorization for 15. We can write this as the sum 4 plus 1 times the difference 4 minus 1. 4 plus 1, of course, is 5. 4 minus 1 is 3. And now we have a new non-trivial factorization of 15. So Fermat's algorithm works this way. If we have some odd number and we're trying to factor it, we're looking for that non-trivial factorization. Let's assume that k can be factored in some non-trivial way. That is that k itself is not prime. If k is equal to a squared minus b squared, we can just as easily flip some of this around and say that b squared is equal to a squared minus k. If we can select some perfect square, a squared, such that when we subtract our original number away, we get another perfect square, b squared, we can figure out a special factorization of k. So let's try this with our example earlier. Let's try this with 8,927. The algorithm would work roughly this way. We need to select some perfect square that's larger than 8,927. So it's natural to start at roughly the square root of 8,927, which is a little bigger than 9. 94. 94 squared is 8,836, so that is indeed a little bit smaller than our 8,927. Let's go one integer up from there. Let's assume that a is 95, and a squared will be 95 squared. 95 squared is 9,025, and 9,025 minus 8,927 is 98. Now that's a problem for us because 98 is not some integer squared, and so in this particular case, letting a equal 95 doesn't help us find a factorization of 8,927. But that's no problem for the algorithm. The algorithm says, well, let's just go one higher. Let's try out 96 squared instead. 96 squared is 9,216. 9,216 minus 8,927 is indeed the perfect square 289, which happens to be 17 squared. That means we can go back to the original way that we were writing these difference of squares factors, and we can say that 8927 is the same thing as the sum 96 plus 17 and the difference 96 minus 17. That is, of course, 8927 is the same thing as 113 times 79, which are indeed those two factors we started off the video with. Now, as far as encryption is concerned, you should think to yourself right now, well, how big of a deal is this? Because counting up from 95 squared, 96 squared, 97 squared, could take a really long time if it didn't just happen to be the very next number squared minus 8927, which was itself a perfect square. And you're absolutely right. This algorithm is actually no better than simply dividing by every single prime starting at 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and so on, unless we happen to know that the two original primes are relatively close together. And that's precisely the danger with RSA encryption, this particular kind of encryption that's vulnerable to this algorithm if we happen to have selected two primes that are really close together. That is, if you think of a list of a million primes, and you were just to randomly select two of those million primes, as long as the two primes have nothing to do with each other, they're genuinely random, then it's incredibly unlikely that using either Fermat's algorithm or the very basic divide by three, divide by five, divide by seven algorithm, neither one of those is going to be particularly efficient, and we're not going to be able to break that encryption scheme. But if I know that the way you're selecting primes actually leads to those primes being somewhat close together, Fermat's algorithm is going to be way faster at helping me crack your code, at helping me figure out what two primes you started with to generate this product, some large odd k. Probably this will all be moot in a few years anyway, because the advent of quantum computing means that we can make computers that are much, much better, or at least much, much faster at figuring out the underlying factors for some product k. But that's at least a few years off, and presumably computer scientists are aware of that, and they know what they're doing, and they're trying to figure it out. What's interesting to me as someone who's obviously super into math is how this factoring pattern that you learn in eighth or ninth grade algebra typically, this pattern we call the difference of squares, has applications even today in modern computer cryptography. So if you are an eighth or a ninth grader and you're learning algebra and you're not really sure why you have to do all this factoring, content yourself knowing now that you can go to the computer scientists and explain, hey, probably not a good idea to choose two prime numbers that are relatively close together, and here's why. That's it for today, that's my Math Minute. I hope that you have enjoyed that. If so, like and subscribe, do all of those things. Comment down below, give me a large odd number. Let's practice using Fermat's algorithm together and otherwise I will see y'all next time.